We pick up with Molly and the load safely back in Jamestown, where she lies about rescuing him during the storm, saying she did it afterwards. Even with the actual rescue, though, the poor dope got more than 200 rems, more than your entire lifetime dose should be, unless you want that lifetime to be very short. Molly herself got 90 according to her badge, so Ellen says when she heads back to Earth with Radioactive Man, she's going to bring Molly back home too. Molly takes that with the serenity you expect from her. None. After the titles, we see we got through the storm without nuking each other, so that's good. I should mention I sometimes do these in advance, and so if I acted last time like no one had any experience with solar storms, well, that was before space weather became global news. Oh, well. Anyway, on drop-off, the Soviet premier at this time attacks the U.S. for their response, and so does Gary Hart, who's running for president in 84. Remember, Reagan is currently in his second term, which completely ruins the joke between Marty and Doc Brown about this point in Back to the Future, so who knows what's happening in this reality. Ellen reports in on the situation. Seems that the mining for ice is on hold. Molly's going back home, so she can't continue her search for lithium. And the rods for the reactor are, if I may be technical, fucked. That's a problem because while there's a sea dragon that's going to be launched that could carry replacements, the Pentagon red tape will tie things up until after the launch. And Jamestown is going to be, if I might again be technical, fucked. I took two years of engineering in college. This is what it taught me. Thomas Paine stops by to say that Reagan's a little bothered that this situation makes him look like he's itching to push the button. So the missiles on Pathfinder are on hold, and he'd really like to see a public relations gesture. An American and Soviet handshake in space. Margot thinks this is a shitty idea. If the Russians dock with the space shuttle, it'll allow them to get a glimpse of our capabilities. But Paine says not to worry about it. The Ruskies will never let it go that far. We're just going to go through the motions here. You know, because NASA's got oodles of time right now, don't they? Well, after a goodbye and standing relieved, Ellen is finally getting off this rock. But the original Lunar Trio is having a little get-together at the outpost, with Danny hesitant to join them. Ed and Gordo provide the explanation as they reflect on how the Vietnam experience drove her husband to an early grave. Fortunately, the changes to the outpost provide them all with something else to joke about in order to break the ice first. But after getting past Clayton's death, Danny says she's ready to head back to Jamestown. But I will not spend the rest of my life just sitting around saying, you remember this? You remember that? I don't know. Some of us make a living doing that. Ed agrees to put in the paperwork to reinstate her as an astronaut, while Tracy is busy posing as one. Literally, I mean, as in for the camera. In makeup, like she was going to visit the club from the Terminator afterwards. As for Gordo... It was just a single room back then. And barely enough space for the three of us to live and work together. The Shriners Convention has arrived. I don't have a room to give. Nobody in Boston has a room. The entire town is infested with Shriners. <laughs> now, if you're desperate for a place to sleep, might I suggest you become a Shriner? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how one goes about that, but it appears to have something to do with driving a tiny car through the lobby of my hotel. Well, Gordo's not doing so great. Even his tryst after the performance is nothing. That or he has the most clueless O-face in history. And speaking of unhappy, Molly isn't doing so great upon her return to Earth aboard the shuttle. Let's talk about space again, because I like it and it's my show. The idea that the shuttle is heading to the moon and back requires suspension of disbelief because there is no way to make that possible. No, not even the refueling fig leaf they mentioned near the end of the season. The thing about the shuttle is that it is a space plane, made to take off from Earth, fly around, and come back. But if you hear space plane, you'll likely picture something more like an airplane that flies up to outer space. The problem with it is, no matter how you slice it, no space plane by anyone reputable... I say that because there's someone who says they can do it, but they clearly can't. No space plane can even theoretically get into orbit that way, because orbit is about two things, height and speed. Orbiting is, to paraphrase Douglas Adams, falling towards the ground and missing. You have to be moving so fast sideways that the curve of your fall matches the curvature of the Earth. If they're the same, then you'll just keep falling forever, which is orbiting 
or that thing we saw on Dread last week. So you need to go fast enough to avoid crashing to the ground. That's why the closer you are to the equator, the easier it is. If you were standing directly on the north or south pole, you would be spinning in a circle, thanks to the Earth's rotation. But you'd nevertheless be standing still. If you move away from the pole, now you would start to move, but not much. Your speed, that, thanks to the Earth's rotation, would be very low. And the farther you get away from the pole, the faster you'll be going. Until at the equator, you're traveling the fastest that you can thanks to the Earth's spin. All that matters is having the correct speed related to the movement of the Earth rather than the spinning of the Earth. So going to the equator and launching is like a speed boost. It lets the spin of the Earth help out. That's why we choose Florida over, say, New Mexico for launching our rockets. Even though the weather would be less likely to be a problem in New Mexico than it is in Florida, nevertheless, southern Florida gives us an extra speed boost. Any advantage has to be taken. Now, why is that? It's the reason that the shuttle looks like it does. To get your space plane up to the correct speed requires a certain amount of kinetic energy. And the most efficient source of that energy is rocket fuel. But if you filled the hole of the inside of the space shuttle with rocket fuel, it wouldn't be enough. That's why it has that big ass thing in the back there. That's not a rocket back there. It is nothing but a gigantic external gas tank. And even that isn't enough. They're a pair of solid rocket boosters used to get it off the ground first. Solid rocket fuel gives you more blast per pound, if I may be technical, but it's not as easy to control. You can control the flow of a liquid, but solid fuel doesn't flow. If you're wondering, yes, it was the solid rocket fuel that was responsible for the Challenger's destruction. That is as far as what went boom. So that's why your space plane straps two rockets on its side and a giant gas tank on its back like it was designed by Wile E. Coyote, because it's the only way to get the shuttle to the height and speed needed for orbit. And orbit is the key. The shuttle was designed to reach low Earth orbit, and that's all. It's why it's sometimes called the orbiter. The reason the Saturn V rocket got to the moon was that it stacked a bunch of rockets on top of each other, called stages. The first stage used kerosene to get up to about 42 miles. That's roughly the altitude at which the air becomes too thin for oxygen, though it had locks to help out. After that, stage two then uses liquid hydrogen to get it up to low Earth orbit, i.e. the place where the shuttle was meant to operate. Then, having settled into a stable low Earth orbit, the Saturn's third stage was needed to propel the Lemon command module off to reach the moon. In other words, once you reach orbit, you still need a whole nother rocket in order to be able to get to the moon from there. Now, it would be cool to think that in orbit at their station, there were a couple of reusable fuel tanks waiting for the shuttle. The fuel tank that the shuttle used to get up to low Earth orbit is not reusable because it falls back into the atmosphere and burns up. That's one of the reasons they don't paint it, is it's not going to last, and they found out that they would save a heck of a lot of fuel by not having the extra weight of paint. Yeah, really. Every little edge counts. The shuttle could perhaps dock with one of these pre-filled tanks in orbit, though, and they could use that to blast off to the moon. That would work. It would also be a great visual. But then it leads to the crux of the problem. Why would you want to? The shuttle doesn't need all that space if it's just going to drop off or pick up our astronauts. What's more, the shuttle, as established, is designed to operate in low Earth orbit for a short period of time. It doesn't have the life support or the radiation protection for the long trip to the moon and back. What would be most logical would be to have a reusable craft specifically designed solely to get from the orbiting space station to the moon and back to the space station again. And then the astronauts could dock at the space station and then get picked up at the space shuttle and brought back down to Earth. In other words, the shuttle is used to get up to orbit and back, and another thing is used to get to the moon and back. So this is why I say that suspension of disbelief is required. 
The only way the space shuttle could get to the moon would be in a way that wouldn't justify sending it to the moon in the first place. Ron Moore said that this was a budget thing, and I say the show works hard enough to be given a pass in this particular case. So having sat through that, here's an Easter egg. Linda Park, a.k.a. Hoshi Sato on Enterprise. Declared the re-election of Panamanian President Omar Torrijos invalid, alleging widespread voter fraud. We pop in with Ellen and Brock. I actually remembered his name this time, but I've been calling him Brock for so long I figured I should just stick with it for consistency at this point. As they prepare for her move from astronaut to NASA's deputy administrator. The goal is to get to Mars, and as he notes, you need political power more than the liftoff power we were just talking about. I'm glossing over their domestic stuff for later on. At the meeting, the issue is about cutting funding for Mars research. After what happened, it'd be better to harden Jamestown. The possibility of future solar events causing problems really needs to take priority. Ellen tries pushing back on that, but it's shot down, most solidly by Thomas Paine, who says they need to pick their battles. It's only common sense. Yes. I am a nerd. Speaking of tension, Tracy stops by Ed's office to discuss having someone film her on Jamestown, but he's not happy with her. Besides how Gordo found out about her marriage by watching The Tonight Show, she's been missing time in the simulators. And she's not doing much for the public relations if she's a stain at the bottom of Shackleton. He deserved to know. I, I don't remember you being concerned about what I deserved to know when Gordo was fucking all those cape cookies in Florida. Ugh, doesn't excuse the sim thing, but that's not wrong. Molly's more fun. She joins Ed for couples golf where he makes clear he knows what actually happened on the moon. But even now, she won't directly admit to it. She instead turns it around about Ed staying with Deke's old job instead of heading back up. While they talk shop, their spouses, Cheech and Chong, spend time in the golf cart. Well, Danny's back from college, Annapolis, and Tracy comes by for the welcome back. But she leaves and the boys go to hang with friends, including Kelly who's curious about Annapolis, the Naval Academy, not the city itself. Sorry if you're from there and that upsets you. But you know who's really frustrated in all of this? Besides her. Gordo is at the outpost, pissed to the gills, to the point that Karen has to call Ed to deal with him. Basically, Gordo feels, A, like he left something inside him on the moon, and B, that he has nothing to really live for. He's just going on existing. Ed gets him home, and while he mulls it over, Molly runs into Evil Knievel here on his way out. Seeing as how he likely only has a few years left to live now, he just wants to go back home. She's outraged that it's just giving up. Sure hope Ed doesn't tap her to help with Gordo. No, Ed's got a different plan, actually. He has the astronaut meeting moved up to announce that Danny's scheduled to return to Jamestown, along with Gordo. Gordo, sober, does not want to go back to the moon. But it's too late now, Goober. Pack your moon boots. Bang, zoom straight to the moon. What happens? We'll find out in our next look at For All Mankind.